Right now we have the Weeks family with us. I th thank you guys for being here, uh, and thank you guys for being willing to share and open something that's so personal and intimate. You know, I mean, like you're letting the world into your family, and I uh, just want to let you know we really appreciate that. Uh, so I want to start with Mama Weeks. <laughs> you can just go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Linda Weeks. I'm Jimmy's mom. Well, James Weeks Jr.'s mom. <laughs> I have to make it right. Make it, yeah, you got to say it the right way. But um, this has really been an ordeal. Right. I've served every day in prison that Jimmy did. Oh, well, that, that's a, an amazing way to to say that. that to, that's a really, because that's the truth. That's your, your heart is your child and... That's it. Yeah. You know, you go to visit your child because they're not home with you. And you have to sit in a room. And you've got all these men walking around with guns on that are watching every move you make. And when first time I went to see him, I had talked on the phone uh, to him with a three inch piece of glass between us. And um, then we moved from there to Wallens Ridge. I had to drive eight hours to get to see him for one hour. Then I would drive an additional hour to my brother's house, spend the night, drive that hour back the next morning to get to see him for one hour. And then I'd drive eight hours to come home. And you cry and you pray and you do all these wonderful things, you know. But when he was at Big Stone Gap where I had to drive the eight hours, I could buy him a drink, I could buy him some chips. But I had to set him on this two inch ledge and I couldn't touch his hand. Here's your son sitting two feet across from you and you can't touch him. And that, it tears you up. And I've had so many people, friends as well as relatives tell me, why don't you forget him? He messed up, you know, he did something did wrong. They, I mean, they really said that? Yes, it and really what, what, what what went through your mind when, when someone that said they cared about you told you to, to forget your child? Well, my cousin told me one time, he said, How can, why don't you just forget him? You know, he's locked away. Go on with your life. And I said, well, let me ask you something, because he is an ordained minister. I said, did God forget you when you were out here drinking and partying and doing things you shouldn't have been doing? Wow. I said, no, he didn't. I said, I've made mistakes. God forgave me. I have to forgive my son. God's going to deal with him, and God's going to bring him through this and bring me through this. When you when you first found out, let's start. Let's, okay, let's start with the, the situation with the Christian school because uh, that obviously had a, a huge impact on him. When he came up with this idea that his edge that his education was was not as valuable as money to the school. Is that how you felt as well? Yes. Because I knew other people, other parents that had children in there that was behind on their payments. And I told them, I said, you know, I, the doctor has taken me out of work for a minimum of three weeks because I almost cut my little toe off. I said, if you give me the three weeks, I can get the job finished. I can bring you every penny of the money. And they said they couldn't work with me. Wow. So my daughter, who is younger, I could get her records, or the school, Hampton system, could get her records, but because of Jimmy's age, they wouldn't get Jimmy's. And so therefore, he couldn't go back to the Hampton schools. Did you, did you watch him kind of just fall off? What was that like? It hurt, because I couldn't pick him up brush him off. I couldn't make the pain go away, no matter what I said. And I kept telling him, Jimmy, you know, God loves you. And he's going to he's gonna make things better. And he just looked at me, Mom, you just don't know. Because at that time, Jim, you were already, you already got this revelation that money was more important. And is that correct? Yeah. So she's trying to comfort you. You're not buying it because 
you already know, you know, at 16, the kids already kind of see what's going right. on. So right. you couldn't, you couldn't tell him something maybe he would have believed at nine. Right. And so you're kind of feeling helpless at this point. Yes, absolutely. And I had a lot of Christian friends, ministers, as well as, you know, just basic people in the church. I had asked them for help and all of them had said, you know, this is not something we can help you with. And I said, that's okay. You know what? God is going to bring him through this and it's going to make him a better man than any of you that I'm talking to now. Wow. And God has. Yeah. yeah I mean, because, you know, I don't think that people really understand <clears throat> the amount of hurt that we can accumulate. No. And, and the place that hurt really takes us. Right. Um, and for you to even start off the way you started off saying that I served as many days, I mean, that is such an expression of how much a mother's love really is connected to their child. Now, when you found out what happened, where were you? When I, I was in my van, and or my truck at that time and um, a police officer called me and told me my son had been arrested and his truck was being towed to this particular junkyard and I could have it after they had finished searching the truck for any paraphernalia whether it be guns weapons or drugs and I said Jimmy might drink but he doesn't do drugs so you knew, you knew he had a, a drinking problem at this time? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Because I told him, Jimmy, you don't need this. Oh, Mom, you just don't understand. I've got it. I've yeah. got it. I've been there. You know. And um, I said, but Jimmy, you haven't got it. But that's okay. God's going to take you through this. He's brought you through so much. You know, I mean, I've, I've been told a number of times that he was going to die and he wouldn't be sitting here today. And I told the doctor that told me that he was going to be dead by the time he was 18. I said, no, God's got bigger plans for him. Wow. And um, after I told him that, him and his family turned around and started going back to church. Because he said he had never seen that kind of faith and trust in somebody that you don't see him. Right. You know, <clears throat> he doesn't sit here and talk like we're talking. Too. Right. And, and what, what I think is interesting is that the the people that were saying he wasn't going to do anything in his life, he wasn't going to, it wasn't like they weren't seeing evidence of that. Mm -hmm. They were seeing somebody who was falling apart. Am I right? They were seeing somebody who had a, a drinking problem, who was falling apart, well, who wasn't going in the right direction. What she's referring to is when I, growing up, I had a lot of medical issues. Mm -hmm. At two, I laid in a coma for a week. They didn't expect me to come out of it. Uh, when I was five, I was diagnosed with a kidney disease called pulmonary loxolosis, and they didn't expect me to live past age 18. Uh, I had a kidney stone removed at the age of five, and also at the age of nine, and I died on the operating table both times. Okay, so <laughs> what's, so with the whole Christian school thing, you're already thinking, all right, God does not care about me. Is that, is that, is that sound about right? No, uh, he, he had brought me through a lot, and I grew up in church, so I had a lot of faith in God, but when everything happened at the Christian school the way it did, it was just like a turning point for me, it just flipped a switch, and I was like, you know, if that's what being a Christian is all about, I don't want to be part of it. Wow, and that, I mean, that, no, now that had to hurt even more, knowing what God had already brought him through, and then... To, to, to lose faith like that, mm -hmm. uh, is that okay? Did you, so you, you did lose faith. Yeah. You lost faith. Yeah. And so you, so you lost faith. And you just kept believing, no matter what was happening with him, you just kept believing that God was going to bring him through. Absolutely. So, like, your faith was, like, stubborn. I love it. I love it. Because that's kind of cool. Like, no matter what you saw, you just kept believing. Wow. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's so easy for us to get caught up in the situation and to let the situation dictate our faith. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And you were just saying, I don't care. Basically, you're saying, I don't care what the situation looks like. I know that God can fix this. Mm-hmm. I love it. She's stubborn. She's, that's, 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 that's stubborn faith. That's stubborn faith. That, and that's what I think that's, a, that's what we need right now because it's so easy. It is easy to throw in the towel. It is. I mean, when I saw them take him out of the courtroom the day that uh, they actually put him in handcuffs in the courtroom and took him out. That sounds me. I um, walked outside and I walked in the little hallway and there's this big glass mirror there. And I looked out and I said, God, what have you done? Have you turned your back on him? And you know the picture in the Bible where God's standing there and he's got his arms out like this? Mm-hmm. I could see him as good as I can see that exit sign up there and as good as I can see you saying, I have not lost him. I've got him. Wow. And it was like a piece, you know, just somebody wrapped you up in a blanket, you know, you got all warm and and mellow inside and I knew Jimmy was going to be okay. But at first, you know, when they told me they were putting him in prison, Jimmy had always been a picky eater and, you know, he had so many medical issues and he couldn't read and write when, um, well, he could read and write, but he couldn't really understand what he'd read. And an old Baptist minister went up to News City Jail. They asked Jimmy if there was anything he wanted to do, and he said he wanted to be able to understand and comprehend. So he gave him a New Testament, some paper, and a pencil, and told him certain verses. He wanted to read them and write down what they meant to him and how he understood it. And he said, then we'll discuss it. So Jimmy got so he could read and understand what he had read. Something I tried to do in the city of Hampton no couldn't could do, do, you know. But the, the, the word of God. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the first things you actually understood was the word of God. Is that what you're saying right now? Like when, when you read it? Comprehending. See, comprehending, yeah. I'm saying the first, one of the first things you've comprehended yeah, was he, the word of God. It was, um, Oh, tender, Ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> tender Journey. Right. Um, by James, I think it's P. Gillen. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, um, Chaplain Burns gave that to me and told me to read it. And it, there's a series. It's like two or three different books, but it's all one thing. And I called my mom and I, I told her, look, hey, you need to get this book and read it. I mean, you really like the storyline for it. And I was sharing with her what the storyline was. <laughs> and you were like, what's happening right yeah. now? So it, it was like, you know, it was evidence at that moment, you know, that I was beginning to comprehend what I was reading. Yeah. Uh, which reading comprehension was something that I had struggled with all my life. And yeah. that's mainly because of the medical issues and all that I had as a kid. Now, uh, I want to talk to Papa Weeks here. Papa Weeks, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing you know, all right. Yeah, good. Now, uh, this this obviously had to have been a very difficult thing because every father wants to see their son succeed, and 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 uh, you know, no parent as a whole wants to see. What what how did what was your take on everything that happened? Well, she called and told me what what the sentence and all was. First thing I said. I don't just take them uh, but in uh, 1979, uh, I had a heart attack. Four or five days, I died twice. 2010. 2010, yeah. and then I said, well, <laughs> I'm back, so I know I'll see him come out. So you were, you were totally worried about not seeing yeah. him again. Yeah, you know, and, and I can understand that because that's a, you know, especially, you know, the amount of time that he had, it's easy to think that that, that some, something could happen inside. Mm-hmm. Is that what is the fear? Yeah. The, the, not, the not knowing. Yeah. That was one of the, the things that you were afraid of, the not knowing. Did you guys question yourselves as parents at all? No. Did I you? Didn't. You didn't. No. What about you? Did you question? You're just like, did did you? Because sometimes parents will take on, you know, like, oh, this had uh, to be my at fault. First, I just I just kind of denied it. 
people that work that's the world Timmy was, I say he was going out of state to work and all that stuff. And then finally I had to realize and I, I told him what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't hold back no more. Yeah. When when Jim called and asked for oh go ahead. That right there just kinda brings forth forth what I said about earlier about family and so-called friends. When you're in there, they don't want to be associated with you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you're the worst of the worst because you're in that place. Yeah. And what's crazy about that is that some people who make those decisions to sit, to distance themselves are doing things themselves. They just haven't got yeah. caught. You know I mean? A lot of people who are committing crimes just haven't got caught. So, I mean, that's, that's sad in itself. But uh, I do know that as believers, we're commanded to look after the prisoners and things like that. So it's not even, it was, it's not a suggestion. It's we're commanded to look after those who are behind bars and to show the love of God to people who are incarcerated. So it's, it's just, that's a scary thing that people can so easily call themselves Christians and so easily not do the will of God. That, that's very scary that, that that's where we are. Um, when Jim called and asked, for forgiveness, what went through you guys' minds? I told him, I said, Jimmy, you were forgiven the day you were born by me. And I said, I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad the system says you are. You're not. You're my son, and I love you, and I'll always be here for you. Wow. That's just me. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, you know, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, your mom. <laughs> your mom. And, you know, and I tell people all the time, and, and, I, and sometimes they don't get it, but I think, I hope everyone can get it right now that, you know, a mother's love is so much, you know, a, a parent's love is so much like the love of God. But, you know, it's, it's it, I won't say that if you don't have kids, you won't understand it, but I can say that if you have kids, you really understand it. You Absolutely. really understand that, that there's this, I mean, because my kids, you know, they, they've they been through so much already at such a young age. They've already been through so much uh, that all I do is think about, like, what can I do to protect them? And so I know I, I can only imagine how uh, terrifying it is to not be able to protect your kid. And no matter, you know, even as adults, we, st we still need mama and daddy, you know what I mean? And so for them to be behind bars and not know what's going on, not protect them, uh, you know, has, were there ever times where you went to see them and there was a lockdown and then they, did that happen? Mm -hmm. So there was times where you would drive eight hours to see them and there was a lockdown? And you sometimes, couldn't see him? Sometimes he would call. He knew we were coming. He said, well, there's a lockdown coming. Don't come this weekend. He, no, he, normally, we don't know when lockdowns occur. But inmate.com, when if you work in a mess hall, all of a sudden you see they're stocking up on styrofoam trays. They're stocking, you know, the things they need to deliver food to the buildings. Mm -hmm. When you see that influx come in, then that's a sign that lockdown's coming. And so every so often you can kind of get a heads up and let your family know, but a lot of times you don't know. Wow. You know, um, I mean, there was one institute, or one situation when I was at Walland Ridge where my cellmate um, that would just had been put in a cell with me actually took a bar of soap and carved out a design and it was melting chess pieces down, making a shank. And he told me he had to kill me because of what guys in the pod had said about me because of my charge. And I looked at him and I said, well, if that's going to make you a bigger man, then go for it. Because that just means my God wants me to be with him tonight. And I sat there on that bunk, wide awake, could not sleep because I didn't know what this guy was going to do. And I look back now and I think how stupid it was to say that. <laughs> but it, it's a testimony to the power of God because God kept me that night. The guy fell asleep. The next morning they brought breakfast by. He pushed his stuff out on, in, on the pod tier. 
they commanded him to put his stuff back on the cell, and he, he refused. And so they carried him to the, hall, uh, the hole, or shoe, whatever you want to call it. And they wanted to know what the problem was. And he just told them I was crazy. He couldn't be in the cell with me. But he, he was a Muslim. You know, I had a CO come by and shake my door and tell me that when I come out, because I was in the cell by myself at that moment, when I came out for Podrick, I was going to assault him. If I didn't, they were coming up in there on me. Well, there was some fights at other spots on the compound that day, and so they didn't get, we didn't get a chance to come out for wreck because they were taking care of other situations. But that night we come out and I called my mom and I told her, I said, don't come up this weekend because I might be in the hole. And she wanted to know why, and I told her. Yeah, see, so there, there were these really dark moments yeah. That what uh, that what happened that that happened. Now was this before the letters or after? Yeah. This was before the letters. This was before the letters started. Before the letters started. So there were still like these dark, really dark moments that were, were were trying to come into your life, and you guys had to kind of walk him through that as well. Now what 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 were you thinking? You know, uh, as far as did you get to talk to him a lot or or no? Yeah, I talked to him on the phone. I just couldn't, couldn't help it. I mean, I had to. Yeah. Yeah. I said he's my son. I proud of him. He went wrong. I still love him. And I had, had to be there for him. Yeah. Like she said, some days go up there, you couldn't even shake his hand down. When you go up there, you go through a scanning. Uh, they carry everything out of your pocket on, they scan you, send you through this thing that scans you. You go see him when you come back. They give you all your stuff back, and you out the door. You just almost the only thing they're doing is really strip searching. Let me ask you this, because it seems like you, you guys went through that. But how did you keep your faith when you went through that as a dad? How did you keep your faith when when he was going through all this? I just had to, you know, he just say, "I got to go through this." Let's see him. Yeah, he said, I, just, I like that answer. I just had to. You know, she went, she went one, one, one time to see him at Rodland uh, Ridge up close to Tennessee. And it was on a holiday weekend and one guard there. And he said, well, I guess I got to leave. I mean, I always know. I said, I ain't got nothing to do. say all day long. I said, I'll stay long you want to see him. Oh, they let you stay. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, when he let you know about these wonderful people that were writing him letters, what were you surprised? What went through your mind? I was thrilled. Wow. Because I could write a letter or send him a card, and he didn't, I mean, he was excited to get the mail, okay? I talked to him every time he got a chance to call, because you can't call them. Um, but. I was excited to know that somebody out there, God had sent them into his life to help give him some added strength in his faith and in his walk with God. And after he started getting the letters from Miss Jane and he started telling me some of the things, you know, she'd write him and tell him, he said, Mom, it's like I'm a part of her family. I said, that's what God does. He put us, puts us where we need to be, when we need to be there, Jimmy. So and you knew God was working immediately? Yeah. As soon as he called me and told me, I knew. Nobody knows how many days I've prayed that God would put somebody there to give him that added inspiration, that added word of encouragement. If it wasn't no more than, you know, hey, you're good. You are a good person. God has got something in store for you. You know, and I think that a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that they are what they did. And they, and, they, and they can't release themselves, they can't free themselves from what they did. And that's, I think that's a big mind game that we play on ourselves and I think the enemy just kind of takes advantage of that, you know, uh, on people because we will define ourselves by what we did wrong. And then uh, it's, like, it's like a walking through mud, you know, to get out of that you know, and God has to really take us out to, you know, and really push hard to get us out of that mindset because it's so unhealthy. And it, sometimes it does take that extra encouragement for somebody to come in. Mm -hmm. and, and what's so amazing is that it's a perfect stranger. That's the most amazing part, that a perfect stranger comes into the situation with this love. Right. You know, and it, 
did, did you, did you, I mean, did you feel, when you, when you were praying, did you ever think it was going to be somebody like from the outside writing a letter or did you think it was going to be someone on the inside that was godly or? I, I didn't know for sure. I, I just knew that somebody was going to come into Jerusalem. Wow. Somebody was going to do that. Um, I can stand awesome. and tell him, I can sit and tell him, Jimmy, I love you and God's with you and he's going to bring you through this and you're a good person and all these under, other wonderful things. And to him, it's like, well, you're my mom. You have you're going to gonna say, say that. that. That's yeah. true. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the mindset of most kids. But when somebody, a total stranger, can say something like that to you. Yeah. That doesn't know you, has never met you, because she had wrote him all these years and sent him cards and letters, and he had wrote back to her. And she didn't get to meet him until last summer after he had gotten out of jail. Yeah, January. yeah. You know, that she could actually put a real face to the right. person behind and the so it's like you guys hearts. met through love first and then actually right. met. Yeah. Which yeah. is, that's powerful all by said That, you know, as a preacher, I'd like to say, that'll preach. But <laughs> that, that's, that's powerful that the, the, it's like you guys met each other through a you, piece through, of paper. Through, yeah, yes. you know what I mean? And, yeah. and you had a full-on connection of, of genuine love and care before that. Now, did you, did you get a chance to talk to them before? Uh, or uh, So you no. guys hadn't even got a chance to meet them. No, not until last summer. Well, I talked to them after he had gotten out in January. I did get to talk to Miss Jean a couple of times on the phone when he would call and talk to her. Wow. But I didn't get to meet her until Jimmy got to meet her last summer, and that was a blessing. I mean, yeah. that was one of the best blessings. Because this is somebody who partnered you know. with you on yeah. taking and helping right. you guys get through this this difficult ordeal. Right. That is that is like tremendous. That that is huge. You all are wondering what that noise is. This, the church is across the street beside a fire department, so it's across the street from a fire department. So everybody's probably going to be like, "What is that noise?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, they're looking for me. No, but uh, the the reality is that you you guys. Uh, you said it was this ordeal, and it's interesting how love kind of overwhelms our trouble. And you guys are like witnessing that. Now, for you, uh, when you, uh, when he called to ask for forgiveness, what, what did you think about that when he called and asked? I'm glad he did it, and I was seeing what the road he was going down. You can talk, you know what I mean, the young. Mm-hmm. Young and new and everything, and they think they're gonna do like they want to do what yeah, they want to. Yeah, I know it's tough. And then, then finally, they realized this problem. Yeah. And it was too late. Now you talked about you guys' relationship and that uh, it wasn't as strong as it could have been before, but coming out, you guys' relationship are closer, close, closer to each other. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. You feel like you're closer now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, it amazing how sometimes certain situations just, you know, it, uh, even though it may be a bad situation, God knows how to correct it and fix everything. Right. Isn't that amazing? Yep. You know, that's amazing. Listen, we're going to take a break, and we're actually going to have uh, the people <laughs> who were writing, the pen pals who were writing, Jim, uh, they're here, and they're going to be sitting here, and we're going to be able to talk to them, and that's going to be Miss Jean and Joe Cadio. We'll be right back. <laughs> 